meet Ron Cruzy, studio director for Privateer Press. It's his job to make sure that Privateer has the best looking miniatures in the world. In this video, Ron is going to share with you the painting techniques of the professionals so that you can have amazing looking miniatures as well. Playing hobby games and painting game miniatures go hand in hand. A few things are more inspiring to gamers than a tabletop covered with strikingly painted miniatures. In this video, I will demonstrate how to assemble and paint miniatures from start to finish. I will discuss tools of the trade, how to avoid some common problems, and four fundamental painting techniques that will get you started putting solid paint jobs on your models. So where do we start? Just like a carpenter building a house, figure painters get the best results by having the right tools and materials, knowing when and how to use them. An ordinary table is suitable for working on and keeping your tools organized. To protect the table from damage, we recommend a self-healing cutting mat. Thick cardstock and masonite also work well. You'll also need two pots of water, one for cleaning your brushes and the other for thinning your paints. Next is a mixing tray, useful for combining large amounts of color, mixing washes, and holding water while thinning paints. A paint palette is good for mixing paint and dragging your brush. A palette can be anything from a piece of glossy cardstock or porcelain tile. A sheet of plastic card works well because it is flat and light and it doesn't soak up water. Keep a number of paper towels standing by for cleanups, spills, and dry brushing. An eyedropper is useful for drawing out clean water and putting it into the mixing tray. The most essential tools, of course, are paints and brushes. During the course of this video, we will be using the brushes and paints from the Privateer Press Formula P3 range and a container of Formula P3 mixing medium for mixing washes. Some other tools to keep close at hand are a pair of clippers for removing chunks of metal and snipping brass rods, a hobby knife for trimming excess metal from the mini and for removing mold lines. This tool can be the hobbyist's best friend, but can cause serious injury if handled improperly, so treat it with respect. Super glue for attaching pieces of the miniatures together. Always use this in a well-ventilated area and be careful because it can also bond skin. A set of hobby files. The most useful shapes are half round, round, and triangular. These are good for grinding and smoothing surfaces on the figure. A modeling drill, also known as a pin vise, some drill bits, and a selection of brass rods for pinning joints where structural integrity will be compromised. This tool has saved many miniatures from unnecessary damage. Modeling putty and sculpting tools for filling gaps between parts of a miniature. Some ballast and static grass for decorating the base of the figure. Some white glue for gluing the ballast and grass onto the base. A roll of masking tape and some blue tack. Tape is used for attaching the miniature to the primer board and for covering an unused slot in the miniature's base. The blue tack is used to fasten pieces temporarily and to aid in pinning joints. You'll also need a can of black or white spray primer to undercoat the figure before you begin, so the paint will adhere better. It's helpful to attach your miniatures to a primer board when you use the spray primer. This can be a sheet of cardboard or a piece of masonite. Remember, practice good judgment and use tools safely. Before working with any hobby tools, spray paints, or super glue, be sure to read and follow all the safety precautions on the product's packaging and use all recommended safety equipment. With our selection of tools locked and loaded, we are ready to begin assembling a miniature. Let's begin to assemble a Signar Ironclad Warjack. When you get a multi-part miniature like the Ironclad, lay out all the parts and identify each one to make sure they are all accounted for. Inspect each piece for blemishes and imperfections. 
Understand that metal miniatures are spun in two-part molds in a centrifuge, and this process creates a line of excess metal on the figure where the two halves of the mold come together. This is called a mold line. A feed gate is the gap where molten metal flows into the cavity of the mold where the figure is formed. When the figure is removed from the frame, it leaves its mark as excess metal attached to the figure. Because of these ever-present issues, there are usually little bits of metal here and there that need to be removed. These are collectively known as flash. Without glue, start to dry fit the pieces to see how the mini fits together and to find out how you would like to see it posed. Using the clippers, remove any large chunks of unwanted metal. To protect your eyes, always wear safety goggles or other protective eyewear when using your clippers. Then move to the hobby knife. Hold it like this and only use your hand muscles to move the blade. This will allow you much more control. Take extreme care not to cut yourself with the blade. Work slowly and carefully to avoid injury. Finish removing any excess metal that you did not get with the clippers. A good method for removing mold lines is to use the back of the knife to scrape them off. Using the files, Remove the last of the mold lines and rough areas and get the mini all nice and smoothed out. Be mindful not to file something else off with the back side or the other end of your file by mistake. Once they have been cleaned, the areas of the figure that will be glued together need to be prepped for maximum bonding. There are a couple ways to do this. The first method is called scoring. Scoring is simply roughing up the area to be glued with a file tip or hobby knife. This gives the glue something to hold on to and helps create a tight, secure bond between the parts. The second method for creating a secure bond is called pinning. Pinning is a very effective technique but can be a bit challenging at first. Basically, with pinning, you are drilling holes into both joining pieces, inserting a brass rod, and gluing the two halves together to create an internal skeleton to help support the parts. Good places to pin on a mini are connections that will have a lot of stress due to leverage and areas that have very small joins. Now, to pin the arms onto the warjack body, get your pin vise and the correct size drill bit to match the thickness of the brass rod. Insert the drill bit so most of its length is in the vise. This will help not to snap the bit in half when drilling. Next, begin to drill a hole into the area that you want to be pinned. Drill deep enough so that the rod will fit snugly into the hole. In order to know where to drill on the other side, put a little piece of blue tack over the area. Wet the part with the drilled hole so that it won't stick to the blue tack. Then, press the two pieces together. Perfect! Now you can clearly see where you need to drill. Glue one end of the rod into one of the holes. Let the glue cure, and then cut the rod with the clippers. Make sure to leave some excess for the other hole. File off the pinched end and the burr of the clipped edge, and dry fit it to make sure all is well. Some other common uses for pinning are for arms that connect to weapons, banners at the wrist, fireballs and equipment, and figures with heavy limbs. After all the surfaces have been cleaned, scored, and pinned, they are ready to be glued. This is pretty self-explanatory. Just put a dot of glue on one of the parts and then put them together. Give the glue several minutes to dry, and before you know it, you will have an assembled miniature. Don't overdo it with the glue. A little goes a long way. Try not to get it onto your hands. Super glue loves to bond skin. To help avoid assembly problems, remember to check how well the pieces fit together before gluing. After all the parts of the miniature have been glued, you might notice some unsightly gaps at the joins of your mini. Understand that gaps are a fact of life with metal miniatures and there is no getting away from it. 
but there's something we can do about it. Often on figures like this rake and other miniatures that have organic parts, you must fill the gap so there is no break in the flow of the sculpt. As you can see, some of these areas need to be filled and smoothed over. To fill gaps, we will use Formula P3 modeling putty, which is a two-part epoxy putty. Notice how one half is lighter in color than the other. The lighter one is the resin, and the darker is the hardener. You'll need to mix the two parts together to activate the curing process and make the putty harden. Generally, you just take an equal part of each color, knead them together until you get a solid gray color. Very simple. Just cut and mix. You can also use different ratios of black and white to make a softer or harder workable putty to achieve some different effects. By adding extra white to the mix, you get a more solid and rigid putty that is good for sculpting hard edges, like on machines and weapons. With more black in the mix, you get a softer, more flexible putty. This is good for organic shapes, like the rake. Once you mix, you'll have about an hour of working time before the putty gets too hard to manipulate. To fill a gap, make sure that your working surface is clean of any metal filings, and then roll the putty into a sausage shape. With your sculpting tool, cut the end off the sausage, and roll this piece out into a smaller sausage. Take your small roll of putty and start to work it into the gap. Use your tool to create a smooth transition between the parts. Try the best you can to mimic the shape and texture of the miniature. Putty work takes time and practice, but don't stress, you'll get the hang of it quickly. After you're done doing the putty work, put the miniature down and let it cure for about four hours before moving on to the next step. Make sure to wash your hands thoroughly after handling modeling putty. The last stage in the assembly is to mount the figure on its base. To mount a miniature with a base tab, just glue the miniature into the base. On a large base, you'll need to cut out the slot with a hobby knife. To attach a mini with a foot pin, simply cut an appropriate size hole. Add some glue to the miniature and attach the figure to the base. If you have a slotted base and you are not going to use the slot, just cover it with a piece of masking tape, cut off the excess, and mount your mini over it. Pretty simple. Now that our mini is assembled, there is only one step left before we can apply our first coat of paint. This step is called priming. And for this, we will use our spray can of primer. Spray primer covers the figure with an undercoat layer of paint. The primer sticks well to the bare metal of the miniature and provides the best working surface for our hobby paints. When priming, you generally have a choice of two colors, black or white. Base your choice on what the plans are for the finished paint job. A mini that will have tons of metal or dark colors will benefit from a black primer. On the other hand, a mini that will have very light or bright colors will benefit from a white primer. In order to get the mini ready for priming, it's a good idea to tape it to a priming board. You don't have to do this, but it helps prevent the figure from falling over. Spray primer produces harmful fumes and can get a little messy, so it's a good idea to spray your figure outside. Before you spray, shake the can for a couple of minutes. This helps mix the paint and provides an even coat. Start spraying away from the miniature and swipe it across the mini from side to side, keeping the can about six to 10 inches away. Don't get over anxious and spray everything on too thick. Go for an even light coverage with multiple coats. Allow the primer to dry a few minutes before applying the next coat. Wait about 20 minutes to let the primer dry. If you wait overnight, the primer will have more resilience. But honestly, it can be fun to dive right in and start painting as soon as the primer is dry. The last thing you need is a mounting tool for your miniature. This is just something attached to your figure's base so you can comfortably hold on to the miniature without your fingers and hand oils rubbing off any of the paint. This mount here is made from double-sided mounting tape attached to a wooden dowel. Try gluing two or three bases together to provide a better handhold. 
Here, the miniature has pinned feet, just mounted into the base. With big miniatures, if you choose to paint them in parts, you can pin and mount them onto their own separate bases. When doing this, make sure that you scrape off the paint and primer where you're going to glue them together. Sometimes, the simplest method is just to paint a model on its base without mounting it. It's okay just to touch the top of the mini, as long as you paint that part last. Once your mini is mounted, it's time to get your paint on. There are four fundamental techniques that will help to improve your painting results. The techniques are base coating, dry brushing, washing, and layering. With these four techniques and a little practice, you will be creating painted miniatures you can be proud of. Base coating is all about getting on that first layer of color smoothly, evenly, and cleanly. It is the simplest and most important of the four techniques and is the foundation of which the other three are built. Before laying down the base coat, it is good practice to thin down your paint with just a little bit of water. This will allow the paint to flow smoother. Squirt a little water into an open chamber. Open the paint pot, grab some paint out, and put it into the mixing tray. With paint on your brush, quickly dip it into the water and mix it into the paint. Drag your brush across the palette and bring the bristles to a point. This removes excess paint, so you don't flood the mini. How much should you thin your paint? Generally, it's about an 8 to 1 ratio. It's really not a lot of water. Just enough to loosen the paint so it flows nicely. If you feel the mixture is too thin, add some more paint. If it's too thick, add some more water. After a while, it will become intuitive. To apply a base coat of Menoth White Base to this shield, just lay down the paint nice and smooth. Don't try to get too much on at one time. Make sure to get the paint down into the grooves and recesses. This is the first coat. Notice the patchiness of the paint. This can easily be fixed by applying a second coat of the same color. Continue painting until the desired area is completely covered. Be mindful to keep your base coat clean and precise. Aim for an opaque finish after one to three coats with most colors. Colors like reds and yellows will often need four or five coats for strong coverage. Be careful not to overwork the surface. Apply the paint, then move on. If you feel your coat is a bit thin, let it dry, and then go over it with a second coat. If you make a mistake and get paint where you don't want it, no problem. The great thing about these paints is that you can always go over them with another color. Aim for clean lines and coverage first, then move toward speed. This technique will teach you brush control and patience. Base coating is pretty simple to do, but a purely base coated miniature isn't all that interesting. That's where the second technique comes in. Dry brushing is all about texture. It is generally used to paint only the raised surfaces of an area to add highlights and remove the flatness of the base coat and to give more three-dimensional quality. 
With dry brushing, get paint on your brush straight from the pot. Do not thin it with water. Begin to wipe the paint off onto a paper towel until you see there is almost no paint left on the brush. Now, vigorously brush back and forth on the texture of the mini. The raised surfaces of the figure will catch the paint still trapped inside the brush, making the surface look more dimensional. Remember that this technique only works if the brush bristles are completely dry before dipping them into the paint. You can dry brush with any color, as long as you brush with a lighter color than the base coat. Keep in mind that dry brushing produces the best effect on areas with high surface texture. Dry brushing is hard on the bristles, so don't use your nice, expensive studio brush. Simply use an old brush that is too frayed for painting detail. You only want to get paint on the raised surfaces, so avoid brushing with the grain of the texture. Brushing against the grain will keep the paint out of the recesses and on the surface where it belongs. Dry brushing is messy, so be mindful where you apply this technique. Brush carefully and make sure not to use too much paint. If you accidentally apply too much, you will need to re-base coat the affected area and start over. Less is more when dry brushing. If you want a cleaner transition of color, build up using lighter coats rather than applying one heavy coat. With dry brushing, we focus on highlighting the surface of our miniature. Washes, on the other hand, are all about shadows. A wash is a mix of paint, mixing medium, and water. They are generously applied to selected areas of a base-coated miniature where the wash flows into the recesses of the mini to create a shadow effect. To make a basic wash, grab your mixing tray and fill a chamber with water. In another chamber, add a few drops of mixing medium, a brush full of paint, and three brushfuls of water. Mix it all up and then apply to the figure. Unlike base coating and dry brushing, you're not really painting it on. Instead, allow the wash to flow out of the brush and into the recesses. You can see how the wash collects into the recesses and creates a shadow effect that gives the figure more depth and dimension. One of the keys to keep in mind with washes is that they stain the overall area. So when you plan on washing, make sure that the base coat is a little lighter in color than what you want the finished color to look like. Washes offer many options, so experiment with them. By changing the amount of water you add, you can vary the intensity of the shadows. Straight water washes do not dry as evenly as those mixed with mixing medium. Notice the paint rings and the overall unevenness of the color. If you don't add enough water, the effect might still look good, but you run the risk of completely clogging up the details of the mini which will make further detail painting challenging. Try washing over washes. Here is a white base coated Ferrelgeist with a light green wash and then another darker wash over it. Notice how the wash is only painted into the darker recesses. There is no need to wash the entire miniature again. Layering is a painting technique that requires a little practice at first but is actually quite simple to do. If mastered, it allows you some of the greatest control of your painting. At its core, layering is a technique that allows you to denote shadows and highlights by painting successive coats of color from dark to light. By applying different colors to multiple layers, you can add much more depth and dimension to your figures. When combined with the previous techniques, layering can create some really amazing effects.
The best way to start layering is to choose three colors, one for the base coat, one for the shadow, and one for the highlight. Simply put, the shadow color is just a darker shade of the base coat color, and the highlight is a lighter shade of the base coat color. You can use existing colors, or you can mix your own. Adding a little black or a little white to your base coat color can make some simple shades and highlights. Once the miniature has been base coated, you can begin layering. This Precursor Knight's robe has been base coated with medium blue. To add shadows, brush a darker blue into the recessed areas of the robe. Keep the paint thinned with water to allow for a smoother flow, just like with base coating. The key here is to leave some of the base coat showing to help achieve the overall exaggerated three-dimensional look that you're trying to achieve. For the highlights, paint another layer using a light blue. And this time, paint only the raised areas to bring out the form and detail on the miniature. Again, allow for some base coat to show. By building up two or more layers for the shadows and two or more layers for the highlights, you can create a much more subtle blend of color that helps give the figure a natural, more dimensional look. A figure that has a base coat layer, two layers of shadow, and two layers of highlights has five stages of layering. The more layers you add, the longer it can take to finish your miniature. So find the right balance of time and quality that works best for you. Now that you're familiar with how to assemble and paint your miniature using the four fundamental techniques, it's time to take everything you've learned so far and paint some miniatures start to finish. In this piece, I'll show you how to paint an ironclad using the base coating, dry brushing, and layering techniques. I will show you when and how to use them along with how to combine the techniques. With a freshly primed miniature, there are two things to consider. First, what are the colors you want to use? And second, where on the figure do you want to paint them? Although you can paint with any colors you like, we're going to use the standard Signar colors for this ironclad. The base paint colors are Signar Blue Base for the armor, Roulette Gold for the armor trim, Thamar Black for the shoulders, and Pig Iron for all the metal areas. Now that I know what and where the color is going to be, we need to figure out where we want to start painting. Generally speaking, you want to start on areas of the miniature that are recessed and then you want to begin with steps that are messiest. The most textured areas on the ironclad are the sections that will look like metal. Start by dry brushing these with metallic paint over the black base coat. Put a little pig iron on the dry brush. Wipe off most of the paint onto a paper towel. And then start dry brushing the areas you want to cover. For this model, we're going to apply multiple coats because we want the metal to show up well. Notice how some pig iron is getting on other parts of the miniature. This is not a problem, since it can be cleaned up later. This is why it's wise to do messy dry brushing first. Just keep dry brushing until you're satisfied with how it looks. Using the same brush, add some highlights using Quicksilver. There's no need to wash the brush because you're still dry brushing the same areas with metallic colors. With a little silver on the brush, paint the outermost edges because that's where you want the highlights. Brush a bit lighter this time so you don't cover the first coat of pig iron completely.
The metal is now finished. It has shadow and highlights. Next, we'll paint the gold areas. Start with a base coat of umbral umber because brown looks good as a shadow for gold. Using a base brush, thin some paint and then cover each area with a nice, even base coat of brown. Once it's done, let it dry and then go back to dry brushing. This time, paint over the umbral umber with Rulet Gold. Use as many coats as necessary to get a nice golden glow, but be careful not to let the paint get too thick. Be mindful not to get gold onto the metal areas you have already painted. Perfect! Now it needs a highlight. Let's use some solid gold. Keep it light and on the very top of the edges. This is all the dry brushing we're going to do on this miniature. Now that the messy part is over, look for spots on the figure where metal and gold paint appears where you don't want it. You can clean up these areas using Thamar black paint since it matches the primer and covers up most colors quickly and easily. Carefully paint over any areas that have paint where you don't want it. Use a base hobby brush for more control of the paint. It's a good idea to clean up any overbrushing as you go because it makes the areas you have already painted look better for a good boost of satisfaction and it also gives you a better idea of how the model truly looks. By looking closely at the model, it appears that some of the gold rivets are overrun with paint and some of the dry brushing has gotten inside the recess lines, ruining some of the shadow effect. This can be fixed easily by carefully painting black onto the rivets to recapture the shadow and help visually separate the rivets from the metal plates. When that's done, you can recapture the rivets by adding a little highlight that will make them pop. Using solid gold and a fine brush, just bead the paint on top of the rivets. Don't thin your paint when painting rivets, or it might run into the recesses. Use the natural thickness of the paint to your advantage. When you're finished, you can see how there is only a little ring of black showing and a little highlight on top. It really makes the rivets stand out. The metal areas look great, so now it's time to add some color to this jack by painting its armor plates blue. Starting with the base coat, paint on the darkest color first, then layer up to the lightest color. On this model, it works best to paint the shadows first instead of the mid-tone because it will be difficult to add shading to a flat surface. This is a good example of layering from dark to light. You don't want to get blue paint on the metal or gold. Try to be precise and patient when painting next to something that's already finished. After this coat dries, put another coat on top to help even it out. Don't worry about getting excellent coverage with the first coat. After a couple quick coats of paint, the coverage will even out nicely. Try not to paint in the recesses between the armor plates. Keeping black lines between the plates will keep the miniature looking clean and visually appealing. If you accidentally paint into the recesses, it's not a problem. Just carefully paint in a black line after you have finished applying the base coat. Once you have a solid base coat, it's time to use the layering technique to begin highlighting the armor in four stages. The first stage is the base coat of Signar Blue Base that's already painted. So now it's time for stage two of the layering. And for that, you will use a little Signar Blue Highlight. Knowing where to paint the highlights is a major part of the art of painting. As a rule of thumb, it's good to start by highlighting just the edges and raised surfaces. Pay attention to how much of the layer you cover. Just like with the gold metal, you want to leave some of the layer underneath showing through. You still have two more layers to go, and you'll need room for them. The next layer will be lighter in color, so mix some Moro white into the Signar Blue highlight. One part white to three parts blue will make a good transition color. 
Start painting along the edges and on the raised areas, but this time paint thinner lines and cover less area than before. Make sure to let a little of the layer underneath show through. For the final layered highlight, use an equal mix of Moro White and Signar Blue Highlight. With this final highlighting stage, the lines are going to be as thin as possible. Notice how only the corners and outermost edges of the armor get this final layer. Since the undersides of the jack are naturally going to be more shaded, you don't need to highlight much in those areas. When you're finished, you can see how much of a difference layering makes. Those highlights really make the armor eye-catching. The next areas to layer are the black shoulder plates. This will be a three-stage layer, from dark to light. The black that we laid down after dry brushing the metal can serve as the first layer. Great coat gray will be the second layer. When highlighting black, try to keep the lines nice and narrow. If the highlighting color is too overpowering, the overall effect will be a gray armor plate, not a black one. For the second stage, mix an equal amount of great coat gray and frostbite to get the next highlight color. Try to apply it as thin as possible. Avoid the rivets because you will paint them a metallic color later on. After the gray is finished, go back and clean up any uneven lines and mishaps with Tamar Black. While the black is still wet on your palette, blacken in all the rivets that are going to be metal. Remember, when painting rivets, do not thin your paint down too much or it will flood off the rivet and onto the blue armor plate, ruining your meticulous paint job. Keep it thick and beat it on. Use some cold steel to paint the rivets. Cold steel falls between the darker pig iron and the brighter quicksilver. This medium colored metallic will match well with the rest of the miniature. Plus, the rivets are so small, they need a little extra punch of brightness over the color of the darker pig iron. To finish off the rivets, paint a small highlight of quicksilver right from the pot and onto the tips of the large rivets. To finish the paint job on your ironclad, paint the eyes in a three-stage layer from dark to light. Start with a base coat of the darker Scorn Red. Follow it with Kador Red Base. And finally, give it a spot of Kador Red Highlight. There it is, a fully painted ironclad. However, a miniature is never finished until the base has been decorated and painted. To start decorating the base, pour some common white glue into a mixing chamber, add a little water, and mix it all up. Spread the glue mix onto the base. Try not to get glue on the miniature's feet. Ideally, you would use an old brush for the glue, but you can use a nice newer brush too, as long as you use water-soluble glue and you clean up the brush thoroughly with soap and water afterwards. Dip the base into your dish of ballast and notice how the rocks only stick to areas with glue on them. Dump off the excess and remove any of the little stones that stick to the miniature's feet. When the glue is dry, you are ready to paint. Make a 50-50 mix of water and umbral umber and paint it into the ballast. The paint should be very thin, so it will run into the ballast easily and stain it, much like a wash. When that dries, dry brush the painted ballast with rucksack tan. Follow that up by dry brushing a final highlight layer of Minoth white base. For the final touches, clean up any dry brushing spillover on the edges of the base with Thamar black. Let that dry, then dab some glue onto the painted ballast. 
put some static grass on the glue. And then, tap the underside of the vase with the end of a brush. This will help make the static grass stand tall. Knock off any excess grass and then let it dry. And that's all there is to it. Combine practice and patience with a little know-how and you can get a fantastic looking paint job on your model. Now that we've seen some of our techniques in action on a giant metal armored robotic beat stick, let's take a look at how to apply these techniques on the flesh and folds of a human. In this section, I will paint a human female war caster from War Machine named Sorsha. I will be using all four of the fundamental painting techniques with a focus on how to apply them to people instead of machines. In addition, I'll show you how to use washes and alternative dry brushing. When painting the ironclad, we learn it is best to start with the most recessed areas. Because Sorsha's face is recessed, painting it means getting paint on everything else around it, making it rather messy. Not only that, but starting with the face also helps create the figure's personality. From there, the character of the mini will follow. Start with a black undercoat, then paint her face using three-stage layering. Start with the darkest color first, Midland Flesh. Once the base coat is down, give her some eyeshadow. Mix a bit of black into the base coat color until you have a dark hue that still retains some of the flesh color. Next, paint the mix under her eyebrows. This helps give some depth and dimension to her face and will help bring attention to her eyes. Blacken out her eyes and mouth with some Thamar Black. She might look a little scary now, but we'll come back and finish the eyes later. Now it's time to add the skin highlights. Begin to layer some Rin flesh on her cheeks, upper lip, nose, and chin. Remember to leave some of the lower layer showing through. Notice how the form of her face is already starting to take shape. Mix a little Minoth white highlight in with the Rin flesh and paint on the finest highlights hitting just the tips of the cheeks, nose, lips, and chin. For the lips, mix a little Kador red base in with some Rin Flesh. However, only paint the bottom lip, because often, if you paint the upper lip, it makes the character look more like a harlot than a respected battlefield commander. Now for the eyes. First, paint in the eye sockets with Minoth White Highlight. Take extreme care to keep the paint only in the sockets and leave only a thin line of black around the edge. When painting eyes, it's best to choose an off-white color. Using pure white can make your figure look freakish and unnatural. To finish off the eyes, paint in the pupils with a small black dot. Pupil placement can suggest everything, from a lively look to a cold, steely gaze. Now we will paint the metal areas, but we will not use dry brushing like we did with the ironclad. We will use washes instead. First, base coat the metal area, and for Sorsha, it's on her weapon. It will probably take a couple of coats to get an opaque base color of steel. Because the armor wash will stain the paint a little darker, use the lighter cold steel for the base coat instead of the darker pig iron. Coupled with the wash, this will be better for contrast for creating the shadows. The Formula P3 range of paints has pre-made washes that produce similar results without having to make new washes every time. To apply the wash, just run some of the mix over the base-coated weapon. The wash will run into the recesses and collect to create natural shadows. It will also darken and stain the overall color of the metal. There you go. This is a super fast technique with satisfying results. 
A warcaster like Sorsha commands attention, and there's no better way to do that than by painting her in the strong, fiery red of the Kedoran army. Start by laying down a good base coat of Kador red base. Unlike our previous layering, start with the mid-tone first, then add the shadows and finish with the highlights. It's wise to paint the red areas first because there's going to be a great deal of red on this miniature and it will make a mess. It's much easier to clean up mistakes that spill over onto the primer undercoat than it is to paint so much red in between other painted areas. When base coating with reds and yellows, there will always be the need to put down around three or four coats of paint to get solid coverage. Now, move on to the shadow layer. With a mix of Kador Red Base and Thamar Black, begin to paint in the shadow areas, which are the recesses and undersides of the figure. In this case, it's better to paint in the shadows after the mid-tone is down, because the mid-tone will be the dominant color. By painting the darkest color second, you can cover the lighter red base coat with just one or two coats. If you were to paint Kador Red Base over the shadow layer, it would require three or four coats, and you would have to be extra careful to keep the mid-tone out of the recesses to ensure that the shadow layer is visible in the seams of the armor. After adding the shadows, it's a good idea to clean up any unevenness or mistakes by going over them again with the base coat color. Follow by cleaning up the black areas around the red armor wherever you made mistakes. Again, this will allow you to see the red armor more clearly. Plus, it just looks nice. Time to highlight the red. Using Kador Red Highlight, paint just the edges and tips of the raised areas, making each edge look like it is being grazed by light. As it is with highlighting black, it can be a bit tricky highlighting red. Adding too much highlight will cause the figure to look orange or pink. However, by keeping your highlights tight and minimal, you can retain that solid red color. For the black areas, use the same layering technique that you did with the red armor. It's already been base coated black, so just start with your first highlight and work up from there. Paint along the raised areas of the armor plates, keeping your lines nice and tight. The next layer uses a mix of equal parts Great Coat Gray and Frostbite. Paint this color on the outermost raised surfaces and edges. Finally, add a pure frostbite dot to the highest points of the armor. This is a good way to make something look glossy or shiny, since reflective surfaces tend to have more abrupt areas of shadow and highlight. For painting the highly textured fur, hat, and cloak trim, use the dry brush technique, going from dark to light. Start by carefully dry brushing a layer of Bastion Gray on Sorsha's hat and on the fur trim around her cloak. Take care to avoid getting paint onto the other finished areas. On this figure, the fur areas are pretty isolated and raised from the rest of the miniature, so you can work quickly and carefully. Next, dry brush on a layer of Troll Blood Highlight.
Then finish off the edges and raised areas with a light dry brushing of Minoth White Highlight. Next, layer the undergarments, starting with Thornwood Green. To keep it dark, use black as the base coat and let the green bring out a hint of color. Next, add a little Minoth White Highlight to the green and line the edges to finish off layering the highlights. On the underside of the cloak, keep the base coat black and layer on the first highlight of Battlefield Brown. Mix a touch of Minoth White Highlight into the brown and paint on the final highlight. To finish off this paint job on Sorsha, bead some Rulet Gold onto the rivets and hit a few other detail areas that need a little sprucing up, like the symbols and spikes. To finish the base, follow the same procedure you learned for the ironclad, but this time, dry brush a little Minoth white base onto the cured static grass to make it look dead and dried up. And there you go, our deadly war caster is painted and ready for battle. Now I'll show you how to build up the muscle and sinew of an unstoppable war beast. In this section, we will be working on a figure from the game hordes called a rake. I will demonstrate the advantages of using white primer, and I will show you a wonderful example of how to use the wash technique to bring out the power and the flesh of a war beast. We're going to paint the rake in the wintry colors of the Legion of Everblight, which means half the miniature will be white flesh, while the other half will be dark areas of bone and natural armor. This will be most easily accomplished by starting with a white undercoat, since painting black over white will only take one coat, but painting white over black takes a few coats. With a base coat of white, start covering the bony armor plates and claws with Thamar Black. Thin your paint down just enough so the black will cover the white in one coat. Move quickly, but try not to be sloppy where the black and white meet on the miniature. You might make mistakes, but you don't want to spend a lot of time painting white over black to fix them. When you're finished, go back and clean up any mistakes that you made with Moro White. It might take three or four coats to cover up the black. Once the mini is entirely base coated, you're ready to wash the flesh. This rake is going to be ready for battle quickly. The flesh is going to get two layers of wash. First, an overall light wash to give the skin some color, and then a darker wash that will be painted into the shadows. You will be combining two of the four fundamental techniques, layering and washing. The first wash will need to be light and subdued. In the mixing dish, start with a wash base of 10 drops of mixing medium and 3 drops of water. Using the base hobby brush, add 2 brush beads of frostbite, 1 bead of scorn red, and 1 bead of exile blue. Mix it all together. Now, start to wash the flesh with your mix. Allow the wash to run off the brush into the recesses of the mini and let it pool here and there. It's okay to get the wash on the small black plates. It will be easy to fix them later. Let this wash dry completely before moving on to the next stage. For the second layer of wash, add more paint to the wash that you have already mixed. 
Mix in two more brush beads of Scorn Red and two more brush beads of Exile Blue. With this darker wash, just hit the areas that have been darkened by the previous wash and the areas that are most recessed, adding some definition to the muscle and sinew of the beast. Again, let this wash dry thoroughly before moving on. To paint the pink flesh areas, you will make an extra thin pink wash, so it will be more of a translucent stain rather than a solid covering wash. Mix a thin wash using a little carnal pink, murderous magenta, and scorn red. Then brush it into the desired areas. Paint this wash into areas that are more flexible, like the softer fleshy areas around the jaw, leg joints, and tail. See how this is staining into the flesh and not totally covering and overpowering the areas? We're just adding color a little at a time. When the first layer is dry, use the same mix with one more brush bead of each color. Paint this darker wash into the deeper recesses where the previous pink was washed into the flesh. Notice how the darker color really brings out life in the mini. To get some deep pink into this beast's maw, mix equal parts murderous magenta and scorn red, and then layer it into the deep recesses around the mouth. To clean up and bring out the contrast around the maw, make an equal mix of Moro White and Frostbite and layer it onto the raised areas. The beast's flesh looks great. So now it's time to paint the bony armor and claws. The first thing to do is clean up the black armor by reapplying the base coat with Thamar Black. Be mindful not to make any mistakes, because at this stage, they will be difficult to fix. Take it slow and simply reclaim those areas where the flesh wash got onto the black, bony armor. The first highlight to add to the bone layer will be Battlefield Brown. Paint the highlights in vertical lines rather than just around the edges. This style will help give the bony areas a chitinous, natural armor look. The highlights on the large plates of the beast's head should be focused on the outer edges. Here, on the spikes and claws, apply the highlights at the base. This is a common way to paint claws and teeth on beasts and animals alike. The second stage is a highlight of beast hide. Make smaller, thinner lines, but keep them close to the edges, just like the normal layered highlights. Keep them in overlapping vertical lines to maintain the bony look. Add a final highlight of Minoth White Base. 
Keep this tight and just on the edges. The teeth will be the last part to paint on this beast, layering from dark to light. Base coat the teeth in bloodstone. Then layer with rucksack tan and finish them off with Minoth White Highlight. Finally, Decorate the base the same way you did for the Ironclad and Sorsha, but this time, use Minoth White Highlight as the last dry brushed highlight on the ballast and static grass to give it a more wintry feel. There it is, a massively muscled, flesh-rending beast worthy of terrorizing the enemies of Everblight. Painting miniatures is a very rewarding hobby and one of the most inspiring aspects of seeing the figure come to life. With patience and practice, this inspiration will lead you to develop your own personal style and taste. So now that you're armed with the basics, start applying them to your own figures and don't be afraid to try something new. Practice often, have fun, and most of all, paint like you got a pair.